A little more than one year ago, nine minutes changed everything. The death of George Floyd at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer sparked massive protests and calls for change from the highest levels of government. Right now, a new look at policing in Southern California. Even after all these months, the nation is still grappling with how to move forward. And here in L.A., crime rates are rising, and we find ourselves facing this delicate balance of where funding should be spent and those changes made. So for the next half hour, we will be having an important discussion with our panel of experts. There they are. We have an LAPD captain. We have a community activist, a former social worker, and a state senator. Yeah, we want to thank you all for joining us. But before we begin this town hall, we want to bring in KCAL 9's Rachel Kim. Rachel is in Long Beach with a look at police reforms already underway here in Southern California. Rachel. Yeah, Amy and Jasmine, when the LA City Council voted to cut $150 million from LAPD's budget last summer and reinvest in marginalized communities, there was strong reaction on both sides. Today, we spoke with a member of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and former LA County Sheriff Jim McDonnell about where we are today and what direction we need to be heading in. David Turner III is a member of Black Lives Matter LA and is part of the Brothers Sons Selves Coalition, which works to decriminalize communities of color. Turner says since the mass protests sparked by George Floyd's murder last year, the narrative around public safety and defunding police have become a part of public discourse. He says some of that has turned into material change. When we're talking about initiatives like uh, Youth Justice Reimagined, when we're talking about what happened at LAUSD, where we defunded school police by 35 percent and invested that money in a black student achievement. Turner says activists have also been working to cut the LAPD budget. They believe the best way to prevent police violence is to reduce contact between officers with the community and reinvest that money into community programs and services. Turner works with the People's Budget LA Coalition, which is denouncing the LA City Council's vote to give the LAPD a 3 percent increase in funding in the city's budget for next year. The mayor's office cited the growing number of homicides and that the city needed to hire more officers to replace those who have retired and left the profession. There needs to be continued pressure to um, push back on um, not only the mayor's budget, but also the uh, L.A. County CEO's budget, right, um, that doesn't invest in the reimagined forms of community safety. If you're cutting the budget, you're cutting people, you're cutting officers, the ability to be able to respond when you call 911. Former L.A. County Sheriff Jim McDonald says defunding the police isn't the answer. He believes there needs to be a balance where money is invested in policing and community-based organizations and programs. Yes, we do need the police. Yes, we do need social programs. We do need youth programs and sports programs and education is so critical. All of these have to work in unison. McDonald, who has 40 years in law enforcement, says public perception of police has gotten worse. He believes that hurts communities now and in the future. The demonization, I would call it, of police in the last year or so uh, has, has created a situation where those that can leave the profession often have, but it also has an impact on those, the best and the brightest, that we could try and recruit uh, to become new officers, uh, they're not coming the way they used to. McDonald also believes both sides need to come together and meet in the middle for real progress to be made. Turner says they want systematic change now, and that means completely uprooting the systems that have led to the current situation. Reporting live in Long Beach, Rachel Kim, KCAL 9 News. All right. Thank you, Rachel. And now let's dive deeper into the issue with our panel. All right. LAPD Captain Giselle Espinoza is here helping lead this new Community Safety Partnership Bureau. We have State Senator Stephen Bradford, who authored a bill to increase the accountability for law enforcement. That's right. We also have John Harrell, who is a former gang member who now works with a community organization to reduce violence. And Winnie Jackson is a community activist and retired social worker with the L.A. Department of Family Services. So glad to have you all. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Having me. So, Captain, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to start with you. The Community Bureau uh, started after the George Floyd protests. I know there was already a community safety partnership in place, but this bureau, what kind of changes are you starting to make? Well, what we're starting to see in our communities is a little more willingness uh, to come forward and talk to the police when there is a, a problem in that community, 
be it a crime problem or a quality of life problem, we are seeing that in the areas where we have the community safety, uh, community safety partnership bureau sites, uh, there is a lot more engagement. There's a lot more communication and collaboration with stakeholders, with the community, with clergy, with service providers. Uh, we're very proud to say that we have opened the lines of communication and it's more um, back and forth now. We, we now get to hear from the communities themselves, how they would like to be policed and how they would like to be leaders in their communities uh, so that we're all working collectively toward the mission of public safety. All right, let's turn to John Harrell now. Your former life in a gang gives you unique perspective. How do you think we can address the sense of mistrust or suspicion within communities? That's tough because it was so long. It's been so long. But in my community, one of the first things that I've learned how to do and others in my community is learning how to govern ourselves and love ourselves and starting from there and get a healthy respect for how I'm living in my community and make sure that every day that I wake up, I do things to add and multiply in the community instead of subtract and divide. So the best thing that we're doing in our community is making sure that we're, not, that we're not the problem, we're part of the solution. And so now over the past maybe 10 or 12 years, I've been able to get over 1,500 individuals that come from gang lifestyles into careers. So now they're picking up tape measures instead of guns and purchasing homes instead of doing home invasions. But it all started with a vision of loving thyself through the mentoring that's being done in the community. So suspects have now become citizens, taxpaying citizens and builders of their community instead of destroying them. I love that, becoming part of the solution and, and loving the community that you are a part of. Uh, Winnie Jackson, um, there has been more talk. Let's bring you into this conversation about even social workers. I know there are smart teams out there, the mental health um, clinicians that are being sent out to these calls to handle situations. So where police would ordinarily be called in, talk to us about how this is now changing with these social workers, mental health individuals. I think that you're looking at it all wrong. I'm sorry. Newton Police Division, where we're sitting in front of right now, has the key. One of the keys is these officers work with children. They work with children. I know because I support them. Having said that, once children are educated and they are informed and given something to utilize, tools that they did not have before, opportunities that they did not have before, they get a different perspective of how to see things. Education is the process of becoming. Information and exposure to that information are the keys that they need so that they can make dis informed decisions to see which way to go, which way is wrong to go, and so that they can understand the data that's before them. When you look at officers, you must not understand that they have families. They gotta go home to families, children, wives, loved ones. It is my belief that officers should work four days on, three days off. The, the splitting of this nation, that it's divided, and a divided house can't stand. When I look at it, you're not looking at it from the perspective of human beings who are putting their lives on the line to serve. Now, no, you're not gonna get all good people. You're not gonna get that in any scenario. But when you see something like Newton Division, who are taking officers, I can name them, who take these children to different events that I provide or others provide for them, who go with them, answer their questions. Children who are living in disadvantaged areas, they get a different perspective. What you're marginalizing the children, what you're doing is you've taken away from them an opportunity to make a decision that is imperative to their life and safety. How to judge what is right and then to look at a when you look at a police officer, if you get pulled over, all you have to do is ask the officer, who's your captain? What is your badge number? What station are you coming from? You ask that information. You got a telephone, they got an order, you can go, hey, you got a cell phone. You can call and say, look, I just got pulled over. This officer said this to me. This is his name. This is his badge number. This is what I feel. You've documented the situation. Children are not ignorant. 
please know that they're not ignorant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are, you have to ask, give them the opportunity to have a voice. You have to help them understand how they're to see it. But at the same time, yep. I'll, I'll complete this statement. One of the things that I think that you need to consider as you look at this is the model that is that I know Newton. I don't know the others that have it, but I know Newton's got a model that can be copied. And I, while I appreciate all of them and what they say, I'm looking at the fact that these are real that, human beings that, that in is, police cars yeah. protecting us. Sure, and, and it does start with the children. Winnie, I really appreciate all of that insight and everything you're doing for the community is what it sounds like. Uh, we are going to have to break away just quickly for a few minutes. Yes, we are going to continue this just uh, ahead. Stay with us. And don't forget Sunday, sister station, CBS2. CBS, this morning, we have communities that across the country are dealing with the issue of policing. So it's a special report this Sunday, starting at 6 a.m. They're going to take a look, a special edition policing in America. We'll be right back. All right, so again, we are taking a closer look at policing right here in Southern California today with our panel of experts. And coming up this weekend, again, a special edition of CBS Sunday Morning, which will focus on what's changing around the nation and the world. That's right. One of the guests will be former LAPD Chief Bill Bratton. He says former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin's actions in the George Floyd case made things much more difficult for all officers. I have a mantra that uh, I, I used, cops count, police matter. The individual action of a cop, the collective action of the police matter. So uh, Derek Chauvin's actions as an individual cop, look at the significance of that action. One cop can effectively improve the image of the profession or destroy it. He did so much damage to the American police profession, unrivaled uh, damage to the profession around the world. One officer, one cop, cops count, police matter. And our conversation with our panel of experts will continue next. Stay with us. Welcome back, and we are continuing our very important discussion on policing here in Southern California. And soon after the death of George Floyd and countless protest marches, people began calling for police departments to be defunded. Here in L.A., the plan was approved, but then the budget was brought back. All right, you might remember, this is how it all played out. Last year, L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti originally budgeted $1.86 billion for the LAPD, but after police reform advocates criticized that, he cut that by $150 million. That meant overtime was reduced and the staff levels dropped. Okay, so fast forward to a year later. Last week, in fact, the mayor revealed his budget plan and increased the police budget by 3% to $1.76 billion. And just yesterday, the LAPD released the latest crime statistics one positive, property crimes are down 6%, but violent crimes are up nearly 4%. Homicides are up more than 22%, and there's a staggering increase in the number of victims mm. shot. We're talking about 60%. Now, we do want to bring back our panel now. Former social worker Winnie Jackson, community activist John Harrell, Captain Giselle Espinosa, and State Senator Stephen Bradford. And we want to bring in Senator Bradford as well. You know, you authored a bill on holding police accountable. Where do you really stand on funding in light of the increase of crime that we have seen? Uh, we're not here advocating to defunding of police. We're advocating for the reallocation of those funds. As you can clearly see, uh, as we've experienced, you see paramilitary equipment uh, on most police departments in urban areas. You don't see that in Beverly Hills. You don't see that kind of investment in uh, suburban communities, pr primarily in Caucasian communities, but you do see this type of para paramilitary buildup in uh, urban and, and minority communities. Uh, I'm the author of SB2. Uh, that's a police decertification bill, better known as the Kenneth Ross Jr. Police Decertification Act of 2021. And all we're trying to get to is getting rid of those bad police officers that we know exist in every police department across this country. This is not an uh, casting a, a negative light on law enforcement as a whole because we know it works. We see it working every day in more affluent communities. All we're seeing is that those bad officers that are usually assigned to communities of color, let's find a way to get rid of that, get rid of them. Currently, California is one of only four states that doesn't have a decertification 
uh, process uh, in a, a fair, transparent way to get rid of those bad officers who have committed crimes. We lead in everything. We lead in technology. We lead in the environment. We lead in the economy. Why is California one of four states that doesn't have a, a method of getting rid of uh, bad officers? And that's what we're trying to get to, because if we know there's bad teachers, they're bad lawyers, they're bad doctors, they're bad elected officials. So let's put with the lie that they're not bad cops out there and have a way to get rid of those bad cops. And that's what we're trying to do in the California state legislature. And that's what SB2 does. And, and that's the bill that just got off the Senate floor the other day. And uh, it's moving out to the state assembly and hopefully to the governor's desk for a signature. Okay, thank you so much for that. But we, we want to talk even more now about where some of that funding could go to help communities in different ways. Uh, John, what do you think then would be the highest priority in your opinion? Well, the highest priority would talk to the experts in these lived communities where this type of activity happens at. Those experts know the communities inside and out. So you fund programs like Second Call, programs like Ceasefire, where they're on the boots, on the ground, dealing with the hardcore, just like I do and others that do it, just like we do it all together. You fund those, then in the community, crime will go down because now you're dealing with people who speak the same language. But there's an alternative to, after I stop the violence, now I gotta go feed my community, which we do it through careers. The careers have been a great way to get individuals out of these situations. And the IBW saved my life. So me being a union electrician, going to work every day for the past 25 years, guess what? I don't have time to be doing the nonsense because I'm doing something productive. I am building America 10 feet at a time. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, Captain Espinosa, even though the budget has been increased this year, is it difficult for you to hear that people are still demanding that funding be cut? It is very difficult, and um, but I understand it at the same time. I know that there is a perception out there about law enforcement uh, that resulted from uh, the Derek Chauvin incident uh, where Mr. George Floyd's life was taken. So I understand that and I'm sensitive to that. Um, I grew up in the community that I police. So I understand the culture. I understand the needs. Um, we continue to stay focused. We are striving to become more accountable, more transparent and more efficient. And I believe that whether there is defunding or um, they call it reallocation of funds, we are steadfastly committed to public safety and we are gonna rise and we're gonna do our job and we're gonna do it to the best of our knowledge with honor and integrity. And if you. I can add, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Kamlager has a bill right now called the Crisis Act. And it's a five year pilot program that does exactly what John has talked about reinvesting in the community, bringing counselors into the community to work with the, these young folks, work with adults, work with folks who have drug addiction. So yes, it's a 30 million uh, uh, budget ask that we're doing. It's a five-year pilot program and it addresses many of the, the uh, challenges that we see in the community. So we're in strong support of reallocating funds in those directions like that. And we have to say something, please. Go ahead, Winnie, you have about 15 seconds. The definition of policing, I've never heard it, and it has to be new in this day and time. I, I, hear, I hear the separatism, continued separatism. There must be a way to take those law enforcement officers, the good ones, as you would call them, and do exactly what's being done over in Newton, working alongside of every community, putting in their, the expertise that they have, learning from them, learning from each other, and building so that it is a solid foundation that we have. You have that so way, much passion. Going, yep. And yep, Winnie, I, I, going, we're going to take okay, this I'm discussion sorry. even for, no, and we hope to visit with you again soon because you do have so much insight into the education and that connection that needs to happen with police officers and the youth, as you were just talking about. So um, here, this is really just to start this issue. It's going to be tackled in depth this weekend. We hope to visit again with all of our experts on the panel there um, and be sure to watch CBS Sunday morning for a very special edition on policing. And you'll hear from officers on the front lines and learn about programs working to diffuse situations between officers and people who are mentally ill. That's this Sunday starting at 6 a.m. on CBS2.